How's it going everybody? This is Beat the Bush. These are the Enjoy Bot Lithium Ion Phosphate Batteries. They're 12 volt, 200 amp hour each. Today I'm going to talk about how to safely connect them in series or parallel to form a bigger battery. We'll also do some capacity tests, peak output wattage tests, and dig into the battery and see what it's made out of. Before you connect any batteries together, you got to make sure they're the same voltage. They have to stop charging around 14.6 volts. If you go a little bit over, you can damage the cells in there permanently. So there's the top end. And if you discharge it too low, it can also damage it. So if you have a lower voltage on one of them, you won't be fully utilizing the whole capacity of the entire pack. So if you order them somewhere from online, they probably were in the same factory, especially if you ordered them together. So this one is 13.178 and this one is 13.178, exactly the same to the thousands. If it is the same, you're in luck because then you can connect them in series or parallel right away without doing any kind of charging at first. If they happen to be different by more than 0.05 volts, then you really should consider charging them up fully. Both of them connect the positive terminal to the positive terminal, the negative terminal to the negative terminal. What this does is if it's just a little bit different in voltage, the higher voltage is gonna charge the lower voltage one a little bit at a time. And if you connect them, for 12 hours, they're gonna equalize in voltage to the 1,000th of a volt, and you can go ahead with connecting them in series or parallel. Each battery comes with a set of these terminal covers. There's a serial number on the sticker right here. The terminals are covered by a little plastic screw thing, and it comes with a set of these bolts. This clamp area would have three or four contacts around the base there, and this makes it so that I can charge at 50 amps. This is a lithium iron phosphate charger. 14.5 volts is correct. Correct. Let me turn it back off, plug it in. I'm gonna turn it all the way up to 50 amps and we'll let this charge until it's done. I like to check the temperature on these clamps because if they're a little loose, they'll overheat. I switched it to charge at 40 amps. I'm actually more comfortable with it if it stays around 100. It's 103 here. On the other one is 103. Here you see 0.49 amps and five watts. It's finally reduced to zero amps, so it's fully charged now. Turn this off. Unplug them. I've charged them fully and this first one is 13.94 volts. The second one is 13.88 volts. Close enough that we can connect them together. I'll attach a negative terminal first. And this is quite a short cable. Be careful not to do negative to positive and negative to positive. That's just shorts it out. And watch what happens when I touch it to the other terminal. It drops a little bit, right? It's on the amp setting on the voltmeter. I can touch these two together. And we see about a quarter amp, it's being transferred from one battery to the other. So if I just attach these together, a little bit of the energy is being transferred from this battery to the other one until they're completely equal. Now, if you have four of these batteries that you wanna connect in series or parallel, you just tie together all the negative posts and all the positive posts after you've completely fully charged them. After equalizing them, then you can connect them in series or parallel. After I charge the first one, it started resting and the voltage started dropping. But for the battery that I just charged, it's actually higher in voltage than this one, even though they're both full. You have to wait a couple of hours for them to drop to a resting voltage before you connect them together. Notice that I'm using pretty big gauge cables. You want a very low ohmic connection between these batteries because then you'll have more current flowing quicker to the other one and they'll equalize faster. Otherwise it'll take a little bit longer. I left this connected overnight. The voltage is now 13.86, 13.86. If I connect an amp meter between the two points, zero current flows, half a microamp, so pretty negligible. And so we can proceed to put it into our 24 volt system. Connect the negative terminal. As I'm turning this wrench, you see it's metal right here. It could very well touch this positive terminal. I'm gonna stay on this side. And then we cover this up because now we gotta connect this one. I'm using the included shrouds. Put this one on. This one can flare all around and it might accidentally touch this one, but it can't because I got it covered, so that's safe. Let's connect them in series, so I'm gonna have this black one. Note that the breaker right now is off, so it's not connected at all. And I have the positive terminal here. I'm gonna make the final connection. Screw it in. 
Going from the negative, it's 12 volt here. Add this battery, 24 volt here, going into the breaker. We'll check the voltage here. It's positive 27 volts, what we expected. You definitely don't want to wire this in backwards. So this is all ready to go. Ready to turn it on. Urgh. Takes a little time for it to start up. It senses 27.6 volts at the battery. There's that click, which means the AC is now on too. AC inverter light turns on. Let's do a quick load test. I'm gonna turn this one on and also turn this one on. The battery's outputting 100 amps, 2.53 kilowatts output. This inverter can do up to three kilowatts. So it looks like it can output another 500 watts. If I turn off one of the heaters, it goes down to 1.1 kilowatts. Turn off the other heater, 0.01 kilowatts. When you use two of these in series and it's 200 amp capable, it means it's capable of outputting five kilowatts. It's currently 14.3 volts. It will read watt hours, how many amp hours used, and the time elapsed. There's a 200 amp capable shunt resistor. It has two little wires going to the terminals. This is to sense the true voltage of the battery because if you try to sense it over here, if you draw a lot of current, the voltage here will fluctuate a little bit. So these voltage wires won't draw much current and therefore it will get the true voltage of the battery. From here to the inverter, from here to the inverter. The battery can do at most 2,560 watts output, but it can surge up to 600 amps for one to two seconds. So let's see what happens if I drive it at 3,000 watts for a little bit. Let me turn this on remotely. This inverter consumes about 12 watts when it's on. And if I turn on this heater, 1.5 kilowatts. Let's turn on this heater, which is connected to the inverter. Drawing at 214 amps, it's a little bit over. It can do 200 amps just fine continuously. This battery can still drive all of this for an entire hour. These wires over here is only four gauge. So I'm gonna reduce the heaters back down to around 800 watts. And we'll let this run for a while. It's this thing making the sound. At 10 volts or so, it's pretty much close to empty. And we see here, I got 209 amp hours out of this battery. It's rated at 200 amp hours, so I would say capacity verified. Remember to never open up the battery yourself. It will void your warranty. It is dangerous to open it. And hopefully me making this video, you don't actually have to open it because you already know what's inside. This is actually a lot more room than I expected. It's all heat shrinked wrapped in there. It's enclosed by this fiberglass panel and this strip of caulk holds this foam piece down, leaving the heat shrink stuck in there. It turns out they use only four cells. You got an in-house built 200 amp BMS. These are actually Gang Fang battery, 206 amp hour 3.2 volt lithium iron phosphate battery cells. They typically use these kind of cells in electric vehicles without the bulky airspace in there. It's quite heavy on its own. Oh gosh, kind of clipped my finger a little bit before. I don't have to take this apart any further because the wrapping around here doesn't have any model numbers or anything to see. So let's examine this further just around this module. The cross section of two six gauge wires is slightly less than a two gauge wire. 200C cables, meaning you can heat it up to 200 degrees and it won't melt. On the negative terminal, there's three eight gauge wires, which adds up to also a little less than two gauge. The heat shrink here is 125C capable, but the wire is 200C capable. So you gotta operate on the weakest link. You don't want any of this to heat up more than 125C. The in-house BMS is over here. The battery balancing wires goes out of here and there's one temperature sensor input here. Looks like there's an empty spot for another temperature sensor they could have used. Battery balancing goes on the first cell, second cell, third cell, they put it here instead of on top of the third cell, the fourth cell, and also the negative terminal. The balancing of course is to make sure all of the cells are equal voltage. If one of them is even a little bit off in voltage, it would try to take some current from the higher voltage cell and put it into the lower voltage cell, thereby equalizing everything. The temperature sensor is right here. Let's try to remove that. And it seems like they like to use this caulk material everywhere to hold it together. The serial number of each cell is right here, 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 and underneath this, and they flip them around. Starting off with the first cell, you got 3.3 volts, 6.6 .6 volts, 
9.9 volts and finally the full 13.2 volts so let's pop the lid here oh wow there's a layer of heat conductive foam and a whole bunch of transistors temperature sensor here from this point to that point it's basically metal less than 0.01 ohms it's probably a lot less than that the model number of the main active device is this ncep 018 and 8 5LL. This chip is made by NCE Power, an N-channel Super Trench 2 Power MOSFET. There's 24 of them on this board. The data sheet says each one of these power MOSFETs can do 245 amps. Since this thing can do 200 amps, you might be thinking, how come you don't just use one single power MOSFET? What you're worried about here is too much voltage drop. Therefore, you want the on resistance to be extremely low so that it's not even noticeable. Therefore, each one of them can be as much as 1.8 milliohms. Suffice to say that you need a lot of them to reduce the resistance so that when it's on, it doesn't take away from much of the voltage drop. So at the output of the battery, you would see almost a full voltage. The temperature sensor tripped. There's zero watt output right now. If we cool it down with my finger, it comes back 23 watts. Let's do the same thing with the BMS. That also tripped, now it's zero watt output. Now the back of the board is connected to this heat sink. The heat sink is glued to this fiberglass board and onto the battery. Well, inside the battery, this is probably the best place to glue it. You certainly don't want to glue it to the wall of the battery, which is plastic, it might melt. So this spot is the most heat resistant. Overall, I'm pretty impressed how small it can get internally. And it looks like you can't quite fit two of these things exactly, but you can add four more cells right here. So a 400 amp hour pack could potentially be the exact same size. In fact, on their website, it's just a little bit wider. They probably just need to add a little bit more room for breathing. So let me put this all back together. I especially like those prismatic 205 amp hour cells inside. If you guys are interested in getting these batteries, check out my affiliate link down in the video description below. Thanks for watching this video. Until next time. <music>